Do you remember going on a family vacation as a kid? In the mid 80s, I spent most of my gaming time in the back seat with Tiger Electronic handhelds. They weren't exactly amazing, but, you know, they worked. Once Nintendo's Game Boy and the Atari Lynx hit in 1989 with their interchangeable cartridges, well, now we're talking. The Sega Game Gear wasn't far behind, and suddenly, those car trips weren't so bad. But with that came another conundrum. What games do you bring along with you? But think about this. What if you could take every single game for a console on the road with you in the form of a single cartridge? Talk about a childhood dream, right? In this episode, we're going to take a look at EverDrives for portable game systems. If you're a vintage gaming enthusiast, then there's probably a good chance you've heard of EverDrives by now. Designed by a Ukrainian hardware designer known as Crix, EverDrives are cartridges for various systems that allow you to load ROMs from SD cards. I previously covered EverDrives for home consoles, but this time we're focusing on those available for handheld systems. While there are many ways to play ROMs and hacks via software emulation, PSP Homebrew being especially popular method for portable games, the appeal of flashcards is playing those games on their original hardware. Of course, EverDrives are not the only flashcards in town. Retro HQ has made flashcards for other portable consoles like the Atari Lynx and the Neo Geo Pocket Color. And of course, we have to acknowledge the options available for the Nintendo DS and more. Needless to say, I'd certainly like to take a look at those in the future, but for now I'm going to have to focus on the ones that I have on hand here. Setting up each EverDrive is a fairly standard procedure. First, download the operating system file from Crix.com and copy it, along with whatever ROM files you may have on hand, to a FAT32 formatted SD card. Insert that card into the slot, plug in the cart, and hit the power and voila! You can choose from any game using a simple text-based menu. Selecting one will load the ROM into the EverDrive's memory, and the console will play it as if it was the actual cartridge. Playing ROMs in this fashion may call into question the morality of it all. For me, I appreciate a game more if I've paid for it, and I'll probably put in the time to finish it. When you have every game for a system at the touch of a button, there's a good chance that you're not going to dedicate the time to any one game that it deserves. On the other hand, an EverDrive is especially helpful for the overall production of My Life in Gaming. And homebrew games give another dimension to its usefulness, especially since we prefer to capture from original hardware whenever possible. EverDrives can be purchased directly from Crix at Crix.com or through Stone Age Gamer at StoneAgeGamer.com. The EverDrives covered in this episode were sent to us by both Stone Age Gamer and Crick so that we could evaluate them for this episode. Before we dive in, we should very briefly touch on flash memory voltage and how it applies to EverDrives. Back in July of 2017, there was a bit of a tizzy around a blog post by DB Electronics, who took a closer look at the memory voltage of certain flash and reproduction cards. He determined that a number of these operate at a lower voltage that is out of specification levels for the original consoles. The extra voltage is dissipated as heat on the cartridge side, which could cause a bit of additional wear and tear to the hardware, and some EverDrive models fell into this category. This is generally not a concern for portable EverDrives. Out of all the EverDrives we'll be covering in this episode, the only one that is out of spec to the system's cartridge bus is the Game Gear EverDrive. There's been a lot of debate over whether it's a serious concern to begin with, so just use your best judgment. We do recommend avoiding some of the cheaper, Chinese-made knockoff flash and multi cards. They're not usually electronically sound and are considered risky to use. For a complete breakdown of which EverDrives could pose long-term issues, check out the DB Electronics site. When the Game Boy launched in 1989, the world had no idea the kind of impact it would have over the next 10 years. Selling over 118 million units in its lifetime, it's safe to say that the original Game Boy, the Game Boy Pocket, and the Game Boy Color are among the most beloved systems in history. After years of service, the line of EverDrives for the Game Boy saw an update in 2017, bringing them more in line with the other Crix products. By dividing the lineup into three tiers, X3, X5, and X7, consumers could pick the model that most reflected their needs. I'm using an X7 model for this episode, 
But for a full breakdown of what each version offers, check out the handy comparison list on StoneAgeGamer.com. The EverDrive GB is compatible with all units that play original Game Boy games. Of course, you won't be able to boot Game Boy Color games if you're playing on an original Game Boy Brick, Game Boy Pocket, or using the Super Game Boy or Super Game Boy 2 on the Super NES. If you're using a Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, or Game Boy Player for the GameCube, then you'll be able to load everything available for both systems. The X7 is a fully featured EverDrive and costs just under $130. The additional cost goes into hardware, allowing for a real-time clock for the Pokemon fans out there, and an in-game menu that enables save states. All models use micro SD cards for storage and should be formatted to FAT32. Choosing a game from the menu brings up a few options. Select and Start will immediately load the game in the memory and boot it up. Select loads your game into memory but keeps you in the menu, and allows you to make use of the next option. Cheats allow you to apply Game Genie codes to the ROM in memory. Finally, ROM info is pretty self-explanatory. This details information such as size and, hey, mapper. Like the NES before it, many Game Boy games use special hardware to enhance certain games. A mapper would tell the system how to access and use this hardware, which oftentimes resulted in some neat tricks. A number of mappers were used during the Game Boy's lifetime, and the most popular ones are fully supported here. If you press select on the main EverDrive menu, you're brought to the options menu. Here you can make some tweaks to the functionality, such as enabling cheats, adjusting the real-time clock, or pick one of your most recently played games. Or, if you're feeling indecisive, hit the random game option and go to town. Games themselves load pretty quick, but it's not quite instantaneous. That's yeah, a little bit longer than I thought. I've spent quite a bit of time picking random games and I haven't run into any real issues at all. Although it's completely possible that I just got lucky, I feel that the EverDrive hardware is mature enough to work with most ROMs at this point. One thing to keep in mind is if you play an original Game Boy game on color capable hardware, you'll have to set your color palette every time you boot up a game. Not a problem if you like the default palette, but if you like using regular old boring black and white like me, don't forget to hold down the B button and press left on the D-pad during boot up. One of the nicest convenience of modern game emulation is the creation and loading of save states. If you can't quite make it past a section of a game or you suddenly have to stop playing, being able to save, quit, and resume at a later time is invaluable. Heck, even Nintendo's own virtual console on the 3DS incorporates this feature. So perhaps it goes without saying, but the addition of save states on the X7 is a killer upgrade over the X3 and X5. That said, how to access this feature took me far longer to figure out than I'd like to admit. I assumed that it was accessed using a button combination much like the in-game menu of the Mega EverDrive for the Sega Genesis. I tried everything, but I simply couldn't get it to work. Turns out it's much simpler than that, but it was a little obtuse to figure out. On the center of the PCB, there's a button that can be activated if you push in on the center of the cartridge shell. Doing so pauses the game and brings up the in-game menu where you can save, load, and return to the main menu. The in-game menu may not work in certain games, although the only ones I personally ran into was Battletoads and Ragnarok's world. I'm sure there's more, so don't freak out if the button does nothing. Not everything is perfect with save states though. Saving and loading does work fairly quickly, but sometimes the sound and music may not play correctly upon loading your state. Now that I think about it, I'm not really sure if it could be done any other way. It's a super convenient feature for portable games made before a sleep function was built into the hardware itself. 
In addition to the Game Boy and Game Boy Color's huge game libraries, a number of ROM hacks and fan translations have been created over time. Here's some stuff that I recommend you should check out. The Game Gear was Sega's entry into the portable market. Armed with a full color screen, it was poised to deal a fatal blow to the Game Boy and double A batteries everywhere. But as we know, it didn't quite work out that way. But that's not to say that it didn't have its fair share of great games. At first, the EverDrive GG, along with its $90 price tag, might not seem like the greatest value proposition. A smallish game library puts it firmly in the non-essential category. But if you take a look at some of the console's innate abilities, it might suddenly become a bit more interesting to you. I found it kind of odd that the form factor of the cart itself is unlike other EverDrives in that it doesn't have an external SD card slot. You have to physically open up the cartridge shell to insert the micro SD card. It is pretty much a one and done situation though, because you can fit the entire library on a 2 gig card with tons of space to spare. There is no built-in sorting when it comes to the EverDrive GG's operating system, so directories and ROMs may appear out of order. You might want to use a program like DriveSort to make things look nice and tidy. Launching a game does take significantly longer due to the older tech used in this EverDrive in particular. Alright, on to compatibility. The EverDrive GG boasts just about 100% game support, and I didn't really run into many reasons to doubt this claim. Of course, it's the games that are outside of that near 100% that we're probably the most interested in. The most unfortunate game under this umbrella is the Game Gear version of Gunstar Heroes. This is pretty much a bummer. It's completely unplayable with tons of graphical corruption and random resets. It's worth noting that games with battery backup will save directly to the SD card, so there's really no reason to hesitate playing RPGs at all. So check out the Shining Force games if you're a fan of the series. For me, I was finally able to give Fantasy Star Gaiden a spin thanks to the fan translation. As you may or may not know, the Game Gear is an evolution of the Sega Master System. It's so similar that a cartridge pass-through device called the Master Gear was released allowing you to play Master System cartridges directly on a Game Gear. Upon detecting an SMS game, the system kicks into Master System compatibility mode to play the game, which means... Master System ROMs will also run on the EverDrive GG. It's as simple as loading ROMs with the .SMS file extension. In fact, you can even load ROMs of games that were released on the Sega card format. The only real downside to SMS games on the Game Gear is that the sprites and in-game objects tend to be a bit smaller because they're a higher resolution and meant for a larger CRT television. Most of the time when games were ported to the Game Gear, they'd zoom in on the action, sacrificing playing field size for larger sprites. There were times when both the Game Gear and Master System versions of a game contained the same ROM. For instance, Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse is essentially a Master System game on a Game Gear cartridge. The game plays in SMS compatibility mode. And yes, it works just fine. As a quick tangent, if you have a Game Gear equipped with a video output mod, which is part of the McWill LCD screen mod that Jason from Game Tech US put in my system, then Master System games will appear in their native resolution when connected to an external display. 
On a CRT, games that use Master System mode will fill the screen, while native Game Gear titles only use a portion of the screen. Before we get too carried away, there are of course some limitations regarding Master System games. If you play a Super Scope 3D game, there's just no way to connect the 3D glasses. Naturally, light phaser games are also unplayable due to the display technology needed. Finally, support for Sega SD-1000 games was added in a more recent OS update. But unfortunately, game compatibility seems to be a bit hit or miss. At least with the ROM set I was using. Too bad. I was looking forward to spending some time with Dragon Wang on the go, but the palette seems to be a bit busted. Sorry, Dragon Wang. If you're a fan of the Game Gear and Master System, the EverDrive GG is well worth it. If you have a Game Gear capable of TV output, then the value increases significantly. I suppose it's worth noting that the EverDrive GG is perhaps the only one that hasn't received an update or refresh in the last several years, so it's possible there could be one right around the corner. In addition to the previously mentioned Fantasy Star Gaiden, here's some other goodies that I think you should try out. The much-anticipated follow-up to the Game Boy Color arrived in 2001. Putting power in your pocket to rival the Super NES, the Game Boy Advance may just be the best portable console ever made, and it has a game library to prove it. The EverDrive GBA X5 arrived in 2016 amid much anticipation. Despite the X5 label, at the time of this video, no X3 or X7 models exist. It runs around $100 and uses micro SD cards. The first thing that probably caught your eye might have been the slightly out-of-spec form factor. Yes, it's a bit bigger than a typical GBA card, more akin to a Yoshi Topsy Turvy cartridge. There's a lot going on inside this thing, so its larger size does make a lot of sense. All the same, it works quite nicely with the different ways there are to play Game Boy Advance titles. The original Game Boy Advance, the GBA SP, the Game Boy Advance Micro, and yeah, it also works when inserted into a GBA slot on a Nintendo DS and DS Lite. Heck, it even works with the Visteon GBA player. It's probably not too much of a stretch to believe that it will work with the Game Boy player on the GameCube too. Well, just to confirm, it does, using both the official software disc and the Game Boy interface if you're looking for some of that 240p goodness. At this point, you know what to expect when it comes to the OS. The functionality is pretty close to what we've seen with the EverDrive GB. Games boot up super quickly, but if you want to speed it up even more, turn on Quick Boot in the options and it'll bypass the good old GBA boot screen. I guess this might cause some compatibility issues with certain games, so I feel like the second save probably isn't worth the hassle. The EverDrive GBA claims to work with nearly 100% of games, although incompatibilities oftentimes comes down to a lack of special hardware required. Games like Boktai will load, but will ultimately be unplayable due to not having a solar sensor available. In many instances, ROM hacks have been devised that attribute these gameplay mechanics to a button combination. Hey, it's not the way these games are meant to be played, but I do appreciate these workarounds. However, in some cases, solutions to hardware-based problems are already integrated into the unit. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, for instance, use a real-time clock to enhance gameplay, and are already accounted for in the OS. There were a bunch of GBA video cartridges that were released in the later years of the console's life that had full episodes of shows on them. At this point in time, certain titles are unsupported due to the foul size of the video. In general though, I don't think it's too huge of a loss outside of the novelty of the format. With these limitations in mind, feel free to dive in and see what the GBA library has to offer. The system has a glowing reputation for a reason. 
The Game Boy line has always been renowned for its support of previous platforms, and you'd expect the GBA EverDrive to take advantage of that ability. Well, surprisingly, that isn't exactly the case, and there's no native support for non-GBA games. The big reason for this is because of a physical switch inside of the cartridge slot that needs to be pushed down to enable Game Boy compatibility mode. Of course, Crix knew this would be an issue, and over time devised a workaround that uses a third-party emulator called Goomba. This was kind of surprising seeing that an EverDrive's primary allure is playing ROMs on real hardware for an authentic experience. So you're going to need an EverDrive GB if that's really important to you. Just put the emulator file in the system folder and you can boot Game Boy and Game Boy Color ROMs just fine. Being that it is emulation, you might run into some instances of bugs and glitches that aren't present with pure hardware functionality. However, games do run in a pixel accurate one-to-one -one mode, so they do a good job of approximating a true experience overall. Interestingly, Goomba isn't the only emulator that the X5 is capable of using. As of firmware 1.11, you can also play NES, Master System, and Sega Game Gear ROMs using accompanying emulators. These additional emulators are a fun novelty, but all run with a number of inaccuracies. The NES and Sega Master System games are scaled and stretched to fill the screen, which makes text and other graphical flourishes look all wrong. The sound on Master System games is especially atrocious. Each of these emulators have a few options and tweaks that can be accessed by hitting L and R while in a game. Doing this lets you toggle through available color palettes and more odds and ends. Because it's an X5 model, surely Crix has some ideas for an X7 up his sleeve. Maybe native Game Boy and Game Boy Color support via physical switch? Save states seem to be a normal feature of X7 EverDrives as well, so I'm sure they'd be included. The Game Boy Advance's library was pretty staggering, and there was a whole bunch of stuff that was never released in the US. Here's some stuff I think you should definitely check out. These handy little devices can put a console's game library, along with excellent fan translations, homebrews, and hacks into the palm of your hands. This is especially true with portable EverDrives, since you can take the console and its games with you anywhere. If you ask me, this might just be the absolute best use of flashcard technology. It just makes sense. Having all your games on one cart is a dream. Unless, of course, you're also nostalgic for carrying around all your games and accessories like this kit. Thank <laughs> you. 